On December 3rd, 1968, uh, there were twin girls that were born in the city of Hamilton. They, the circumstances surrounding their birth were uh, somewhat complicated, and it meant that their mother and father were unable to keep them in their family, and so they were put up for adoption. They were adopted by a young church planter. He was planting a church in the city of Kitchener at the time, and uh, they were brought into his home. I know a little bit about their family because if you take a look at this picture, um, that's my family and they're my sisters. They were adopted into my family before I was two years old. That's me in a bow tie, by the way. <laughs> Boy, I was cute, wasn't I? <laughs> what happened, right? That's what my kids always say. Um, so they were adopted into my family. I grew up from before the age of two never knowing anything different. They were my sisters. They look a little different from the rest of the family, but as far as I was concerned growing up, there was no difference. I treated them exactly the way a brother always treats their sisters, right? We all know how that goes. As a brother, they were my sisters. Adoption was completely normal to me growing up. I never really thought about it. It was just kind of another mechanism by which kids become part of a family. And these are, this is my, nor my natural sister. This is my, I almost said normal. That would be really bad. This is my natural sister. These are my adopted sisters. And it was just kind of the way things happened. When you fast forward to being an adult, um, we had, Susan and I had uh, six children of our own, um, and, uh, and then we began contemplating going down this path of adoption, and suddenly, the meaning of adoption became much more profound and significant in my life, in, in our lives. I had grown up understanding adoption. I had adopted sisters, obviously, but a number of years ago, we made the decision that we were going to adopt this little guy into our family, um, actually, some of you might recognize him more by a more recent picture because he often is seen running around the church here. His name is Gabriel, and we adopted in, him into our family. He's now 11, uh, and uh, he certainly keeps us young. Um, but he is a fabulous addition to our family. He came to us through adoption. We made a decision to bring Gabriel in as part of our family. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the details of that journey. What I wanted to do is I wanted to focus on adoption itself in that context because it's an interesting process if you've gone through it, and I'm sure some folks here have, is that you actually go through this exercise where you have to put all of the paperwork together, all of the pieces have to come together, and everything goes up in front of a judge. And then the judge looks at everything and determines, is everything in order here for this adoption to happen? Have all of the requirements been fulfilled for this adoption to take place? And if the judge determines that that's the case, he signs an order, and through that process, that legal transaction, the child becomes legally a member of your family. He legally has all of the same privileges, benefits, responsibilities, obligations, everything that you have as a natural born son or daughter, your adopted son or daughter has all of those same privileges and rights. Legally, they're, they're in, embedded right within your family. He's recognized as our son by the government, by the medical system, by the justice system, by the educational system. It's just a complete transform transformative process by which he moves from one situation into a status of being our son. One of the things that I found really remarkable about this process was when we went through the exercise of actually completing the adoption, um, they actually issue a brand new birth certificate. And so literally we have a birth certificate that has his name on it, Gabriel Samuel Isaac Lewis, and it says that his parents are Susan and Peter Lewis. It's as if he was born again with all of that identity around him. His old birth records are gone. He is legally, by, by birth it shows, our son. His birth certificate has our names on it as his mother and his father. It's like he was reborn. As I was coming up here, you heard a, a few seconds of a song written by an artist named Stephen Curtis Chapman, who a number of years ago began the process of, of adopting children into his family, in his case from China. And, and he wrote this song after he adopted his first daughter. 
And there's one line in that song that I believe is so compelling, and it says this, when love takes you in, everything changes. When love takes you in, everything changes. You know, I wanted to share today on adoption, not because I wanted to encourage all of you to go out and run out and become adoptive parents, but because adoption is something that is truly at the heart of the gospel. Adoption is at the heart of the good news of Jesus. Adoption is important for us to understand as believers in Jesus. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 4 through 7. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. It says this, But when the right time came, God sent His Son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent Him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that He could adopt us as His very own children. And because we are His children, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father, now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are His child, God has made you His heir. The Bible tells us that God doesn't just forgive us. He adopts us. He brings us into His family, not just as subjects. I mean, He could have stopped there. He could have said, I'll be your king, I'll be your master, you'll be my subject. That's not what God does. He brings us in and He adopts us as children in His family. And in that process, we get all of the rights and privileges and obligations of being a son or a daughter of God. Look at Ephesians 1 verse 5. It says there, God decided in advance to adopt us into His own family by bringing Himself, by bringing us to Himself through Jesus Christ. This is what He wanted to do, and it gave Him great pleasure. I love that line. This is what He wanted to do, and it gave Him great pleasure. God made a conscious decision. Adoption is a decision, it's a choice. God chose, God decided that He wanted to bring us back into a relationship with Him that was not master-servant, not subject-king, but was father-son, father-daughter, part of a family. God made an active choice. We were slaves to the law, the Scripture tells us. We were slaves to sin, but He sent Jesus to buy our freedom so that God could adopt us into His family. And we're brought into a close relationship. The Scripture says in a couple of places that we are brought into that place where we can cry out to God, Abba, Father. Abba is a Greek word. It literally means daddy. It's a very close type of intimate relationship between a father and and a, and a son or a father and a daughter. I just want to pause for a moment and say this. I'm going to be spending a few minutes this morning talking about our relationship as sons or daughters with our Father in heaven. And I just want to acknowledge something. Um, one of the challenges that we sometimes deal with when we talk about this is this. We all have fathers. Anybody here does not have a father? Anybody, anybody no, no fathers? No. We all have fathers. We all have fathers. As human fathers, we do our best, but we're also imperfect. And all my children said amen. We're all, we're all imperfect. And, and yet we are in some ways an image and, and a representation of that relationship. And I, need to, I think we need to acknowledge that there are sometimes in some people, and in a room like this, there are people in this room where your relationship with your father was not just imperfect, it was actually pretty bad. And we can see that there are times when people struggle with this. How can I relate with God as a father when my earthly father wasn't a very good father for me? And I want to just challenge you this morning to set that aside, and I'd like you to focus in on this because God reveals Himself to us as a good father, and He wants to be a father to you that is good and that demonstrates to you the love of a father for His child. So the question, when, when we actually look at, at the Scripture here, um, one of my favorite writers, Max Lucado, says this, when we come to Christ, God not only forgives us, He also adopts us. 
Through a dramatic series of events, we go from condemned orphan with no hope to adopted children with no fear. Through a dramatic series of events, we go from a condemned orphan with no hope to adopted children with no fear. So what does this mean for us? I'm going to be spending some time this morning, I could talk about a lot of things about what this means for us, but I'm going to focus really in on just four areas that I would suggest are the meaning of adoption to us and what it means for us to be adopted. And the first thing I think is very clear is it means that we have and we experience a new life, a new life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says this, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. You know, that is the picture of adoption. That's the picture of adoption. Adoption, uh, at, this at the time that Paul was writing, he was writing to folks who would have understood the context from a Roman perspective, from the Roman law perspective. And adoption actually existed in Roman culture. It was an incredibly serious legal act uh, and it, it enabled a person to take a family into their own family who was not their child. That adopted child had all the rights of a son, and they lost all of the obligations from their old family, including if their old family had debts or obligations, those were wiped away as if they never existed. Adoption is, in fact, a dramatic picture of transformation. Adoption is not sort of an incremental process, although when you're going through it, it feels like it takes forever. But at that moment of adoption, it is a single stroke of a judge's pen here in Canada that says, this child has now moved from this status to this status. The old identity is gone. You would not be able to find information about Gabriel's birth records easily. It's gone. It's moved away. Gabriel has a new identity in our home, and we as believers in Christ have a new identity. We were members of Adam's old family. We were captured under the old law. We were caught in the bondages of sin. We were in that environment, and through adoption, Jesus, through Jesus, we are brought into that place where God adopts us into His family, and the old identity is gone, and we have a new new life. It's a complete transformation. We are completely released of the responsibility and debts of sin because Jesus paid the debt in full. This is something that is easy sometimes for us who've been in the church for a long time to think about this. Yeah, old, the old is gone, the new has come, this is great. This is amazing. This is transformational. This is not something just to kind of uh, acknowledge. This is something to be in awe of. The old is gone. We have been moved from a complete uh, identity in the old life to something brand new. The old is gone. We have a new life in the Father's home, a new life in the family of God. We have a new position. When love takes you in, everything changes. When love takes you in, everything changes. Second thing though, we don't only have a new life, <clears throat> we have an overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love that we experience from God. We sang that this morning, and those words are so big, overwhelming, never-ending. Reckless love. You know, God loves you even before you were adopted. God loves all the world. We know that. Scripture teaches that clearly. But we can experience the love of God in an amazing way once we are adopted into His family. You know, people in the world are loved by God, but they don't experience the love of God. People who've been adopted into God's family can come into a place where they can, in fact, experience the love of God. How many fathers here love your children? Any fathers not put your hand up? Just want to check? Just want to check? <laughs> As earthly fathers, we love our children. We love our children. As earthly mothers, we love our children. Amen. 
We would do anything for them. You know, my wife has a mug on it that it actually says Mama Bear. Everybody knows what that means, right? Um, that, that means don't mess with Mama Bear because they will do what it takes to protect their children. There's a love that burns within them that says, I will do whatever it takes to take care of you. I will do whatever it takes to take care of you. I love you. No matter what you do, I love you. No matter where you are, I love you. You know, it's, it's a love that you really don't understand until you become a parent. And as a parent, it's just almost indescribable to be able to say how much you love that child. You can't put words to it. It's something that's beyond comprehensive, comprehension. And that's us as humans. That's us in our finite way we love our children. Imagine how much more the Heavenly Father loves you. How much more the Heavenly Father loves you. He loves you with a never ending love. First John 3, 1 John 3.1 says, See how very much our Father loves us, for He calls us His children, and that is what we are. He loves us as His children. But I want to just pause for a moment and focus in on this one word, never ending. You know, there are times when we struggle as people with whether or not we are loved. If we're honest about it, there are times. Does my mom, does my dad really love me? How can they love me? Does God really love me? How can He love me? He knows me so well. How can He love me? The love of God is never ending. It's never ending. In Romans we read, and I am convinced, Romans 8, we read, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. One of the most fundamental needs that we have as humans is to know that we're loved. And yet it's one of those areas that many of us struggle with. Are we loved? Are we loved? How can we be loved? We're not lovely. And yet God's Word tells us that He loves you with an overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love. Nothing can ever separate you from the love of God the Father. Nothing can separate you from the Father's love. And I want you to hear this today. God loves you. There's people in this room today that need to take that into their heart and know that God sees you, He knows you, He knows where you are, and He loves you. He loves you. He's your Father. He loves you with a never-ending, overwhelming, reckless love. He loves you. And you need to grab hold of that and let that resi reside in your heart and understand how very much the Father loves you, that He would bring you in. There's a hymn writer by the name of Samuel Trevor Francis. He was, he was a believer, but he was struggling with uh, sadness and depression. And in fact, at one point in time, he was crossing a, a, a bridge over the River Thames in London and, and very seriously considered ending his life at that moment in time because he was just feeling so sad. And yet he felt, the, he heard the, the soft, gentle voice of God speaking to him and giving him hope. And he later wrote a hymn that speaks of this. It says, oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, vast unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. Underneath me, all around me, is the current of your love leading onward, leading homeward to our glorious rest above. The love of God is greater than anything that we can describe. And God the Father loves you, His children, with an overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love. A third thing that I would suggest we can experience as children of God, as adopted children in God's family, is an incomprehensible peace. In Romans 8, 
verses 15 to 16, it says, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. You know, um, I remember my children are all kind of grown now. A few of them are in the room here, so I have to always be careful what I say here. Um, but I, I remember um, when my kids were growing up, um, there were moments in time, one of my favorite things as a father with a, a young child was I'd be sitting, I'd be working at whatever, doing something, and they would come up and they'd just kind of crawl into your lap, and then they'd snuggle in close, and then they'd fall asleep. Anybody else ever experienced that? There's just something about that. You know, you put, wrap your arms around your child who's there sleeping peacefully in your arms. You know, there's this, this expression, we talk about people who sleep like a baby. I don't know who came up with that, by the way, because babies don't always sleep that well. But that's what it describes for me, is that ability to just rest in their father's arms, peacefully sleeping. I could have been totally worried about everything that else that I was dealing with at work or bills or whatever it was going on in life. I could have had all kinds of things that were going through my head, and yet our children would just come and snuggle in close, and they could rest peacefully, not worried about anything, not worried about life. Over this past summer, Susan and I um, happened to take Gabriel to see a movie. Uh, it was called Christopher Robin. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie. Um, It's the story of uh, a guy named Christopher Robin, um, who, uh, it's a fictional story, by the way, sorry to break that to you if you didn't know that. Uh, It's a fictional story of a boy named Christopher Robin who grew up playing in a forest called the 100 Acre Woods. He played with uh, some imaginary characters. Uh, One was a a bear of very little brain named Winnie the Pooh. You can see him there. Uh, He also had a a sort of irrepressibly um, enthusiastic tiger named Tigger, uh, a bassa profundo, always depressed donkey named Eeyore, and the incredibly timid, always terrified, and yet somehow always the hero Piglet on the end. And he had these characters that he would play with in the Hundred Acre Woods, and the, the story really takes the rest of his life beyond that. And it shows how he left the Hundred Acre Woods and how he went to school and then he went on and got married and had a daughter and went to work. And when we actually get into the beginning of the movie, what we're essentially seeing is Christopher Robin as an incredibly stressed out, worried, anxious adult. And you know what? That is often the path that we follow, isn't it? You know, you can be a child, you're just enjoying life, things are great, you don't worry about anything, and then as you get older and older, there's more and more that gets added on, and by the time we get to this place that we call adulthood, all of a sudden, all of the weight of the world is on our shoulders, we're worried about everything, and we don't have peace, we don't have joy, all we do is we have the drudgery of life that we just keep putting one foot in front of the other, Anybody else ever experienced that? Sometimes that's what it feels like. The whole premise of this movie was that what Christopher Robin needed to do was he needed to go back to the Hundred Acre Woods and he needed to learn how to play again as a child. And through doing that, he was able to suddenly find joy again and he was able to begin to re-experience the good things in life. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Um, The answer here is, is not go back and begin to play as a child, but there is some truth to this in the sense that God himself says we need to become childlike in our faith. We need to come to the place where we can see God as our Father who knows and wants what's best for us in all things, who will provide for us everything that we need, who cares for us and looks out for us and will take care of all of our lives And that allows us to come to that place where we can actually begin to rest in our Father's arms. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done, and then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. How many of you want to know peace that you can never understand? Joy? I believe 
fundamental to experiencing and walking in the joy and peace and the life that God has for us is a proper understanding of our relationship with God as our Father. You see, as fathers, we want what's best for our children. We want what is good for our children. Sometimes, by the way, what is good for our children is not necessarily what our children want, but we want what's good for them, and we have a broader experience, and we're able to help guide them and, sh- and, sh- and, and, and help them walk through life. Our Heavenly Father, how much more so for us as His children? We need to come to the place where we are in that relationship where He is our Father, our Abba, our Daddy, and we can come and we can rest in His arms and we can know that He's got the world under control. And we don't have to worry about things anymore. We don't have to be anxious. We can be a child in our Father's arms. We can be a child under the care of our Father, and that can free us from worry and anxiety because we know that God has it under control. We can experience a peace that the natural world cannot understand because we understand who we are in relationship to the Heavenly Father. We have been brought into His home. We have been brought into His family. We are His sons. We are His daughters. We have a place where we can rest and experience His peace. And the fourth thing that I would like to just quickly touch on is that we experience as adopted children in God's family is that we have an internal inheritance. We all understand the concept of inheritance, right? It's, you know, one person passes away, they pass it on to the next, and so on. Inheritance is a, is a, is a concept that's easy enough for us to understand in a natural world. The Bible tells us that as God's children, we are His heirs, we are co-heirs with Jesus. We, in fact, become the ones who inherit the kingdom of God. You know, the natural sense, there's nothing, there's, whatever you build up here on this earth, you're not going to be able to take it with you. That's just the reality of the natural world that we operate in. You're going to pass it on to your children who will pass it on to their children who will pass it on to their children. You can't take it with you. But the inheritance that we have as children of God is an eternal inheritance. Look at 1 Peter 1, verses 3 to 4. It says this, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we've been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. You know what that speaks to? That speaks to hope. That speaks to hope. We have an eternal inheritance that God is preparing for us as His children. We know that there is an inheritance that is being prepared for us. We can know what it is to be in His kingdom, but it's not just for the future. I would argue that we, in fact, are in, have, have received that inheritance here on earth. The kingdom of God is here. We can walk as children of God here on earth experiencing the fullness of His kingdom here. God has, in fact, brought us in to be His sons and His daughters. He's adopted us into His family. He's made us His children. He's called us into His own home, made you His son and His daughter. He looked at all of the facts of the case, He says, as you come through the blood of Jesus, all of the requirements have been satisfied, and I can now adopt you into my home and make you my son and my daughter. So four things I've talked about this morning. Through our adoption into the family of God, we experience a new life. We experience an overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. We can experience an incomprehensible peace And we also become part of an eternal inheritance. What does this mean for us in a practical sense? What does it mean for us here in this room today? 
You know, I think there's, there's two groups of folks that I, I'd, I'd like to, to challenge to take a look at this. One group is the people who have already come to God through Jesus. You're believers. I, I want to challenge you to come to the place where you see yourself not just as a servant of God. We understand that we are servants of God, but you're more than that. You're a son. You're a daughter. And God loves you with an eternal love. And God will take care of you as a father will take care of his sons and daughters. And God has prepared a place for you, an eternal inheritance that he has for you. If you find yourself struggling with worry and anxiety, if you find yourself struggling with guilt for the, from the past, if you find yourself thinking and worrying about the future, you need to come to that place where you understand that God has adopted you and you are a son or daughter. The old is gone. You can forget about it. The new has come. You have a new life. You have a father who loves you, who loves you. You have a father who will take care of you and you can know his peace. You have a Father who is preparing an eternal inheritance for you. You can have hope. Adoption is at the heart of the relationship that we have with God the Father. We need to come to that place where we recognize that and experience that and release all of the worries and fears and everything else and say, yes, Father, I will rest in your arms and I will trust your heart and I'll know that you'll care for me. There's also people in the room today who have never been adopted into God's family. I guess my simple question for you is, what are you waiting for? God the Father is inviting you, saying through the blood of Jesus, you can come in and you can be part of this family. You can be legally adopted into the family of God, where you'll have all of the rights and privileges of God's family. What are you waiting for? It's there and it's open and ready for you. Let's just close in prayer. Father, I thank you that you are our Father, that we can come to you and we can know you and we can experience your love as our heavenly Father. I thank you that through that you have translated us from an old life into something brand new. I thank you that through that we can experience the depths of your love, that we can know your peace and your joy. I thank you that we have hope for an eternal inheritance. I pray, Father, that you will just continue to work in the lives of the people in this body, Lord, that you will draw us into that place of understanding who we are in Christ and who we are in relationship to you as our Father. We thank you, O oh God, that you are continuously at work, that you continue to watch over us, that you have the best of plans for us, that we have a future and a hope. I pray, Father, that you will just continue to pour out your spirit upon us, that you will remove fear from us, that you will remove anxiety from us, that you will remove burdens from us that would hold us back from understanding the joy and peace that we can have in you. We thank you that we are no longer slaves to sin, but that you have adopted us, O oh God, and you have made us your children. 